Hi everybody, this is John Forslund as Chuck Caton, the Hall of Fame radio voice of the Carolina Hurricanes. And you're watching the Power Play Break, the place to talk about pucks. Hey everybody, it's Chris Riley back in the Power Play Break with John Forslund. John, before we left, we were talking about the Whalers and yes. then that awful April day comes when yeah. the Whalers are going to leave Hartford. Mm -hmm. What I find ironic is Rick Peckham was there with the Tampa Bay Lightning. I mean, it had to be a very emotional time for all of you involved. It was, and, and certainly that was in, in my thought process, the fact that Rick was in the building and doing the game for the other team, and he had been there a long time, and when he left, I wasn't comfortable with him leaving, and I'm sure he wasn't and all of that. But anyway, we've all moved on, and, and it's worked out. But that day was different and probably the most difficult game I've ever done just in terms of emotion and how you uh, keep your emotions in check make sure that you tell a story tell it appropriately um, warm your audience to an awful situation uh, say the right things at the end when it's over and you have no idea what road this is going to go down when you get there it's unlike any game I've ever called and I'll never forget riding in that morning it was an afternoon game Sunday afternoon this is going to sound hokey, but it's the exact truth, is I'm coming down 91 to, uh, from Springfield, coming into Hartford, and there was a black cloud over the Hartford Civic Center that day. And uh, I knew what was going on behind the scenes, and mm -hmm. I understood why our people were frustrated with the state, frustrated with the city, frustrated with everything, and why the team was relocating. And I understood that it could be a good situation. But I also understood the emotion and how the people felt uh, and the fans, and they're the ones that were going to see their team leave, the beloved Whalers. So uh, tough broadcast to get through. I'm proud of it. I've seen the clips on YouTube of what was actually said that day. And I was a young broadcaster, too. I didn't have a lot of experience, but yeah. I'm proud of what we did that day. What was Rick's emotions like for him? Oh, I, I think he was... Um, he was upset, obviously, but he was in a different place. He was with a new team, a new beginning for him. He had already moved on. But I think there, the part of him was there, too. So it's hard for me to answer that. For Chuck, uh, oh, Chuck I, I, can't even, I can't even imagine what that was like for him. Chuck Caton uh, had been there since forever. 75. I mean, forever. Forever, since 79, since inception of the National Hockey League. So uh, those, are, those are real difficult situations for everybody. Why do you think, even still today, here it is, 2013. Why do you think so many people love the Whalers? What was what, you know, a lot of teams? You know, come and go. Teams move for different reasons. But what is it about the Whalers? I mean, they never won a championship well, in the NHL. Right. They never really had a right. great success, as we talked about. Right. But why is it like still today that people are so in love with the Whalers? There's two things. I think the Whalers, more than any team for for that era, did more with the community than most teams. They were front runners in terms of charities appearances. In a small market, you could get away with that. And in Hartford, they just embraced those players. And then you had really good players, you know, through the late 80s, like we talked about, right? If you look at the 1987 Hartford Whalers, there are 15 guys on the roster that are still in the game today in high-profile jobs. Most of them are managers, coaches, broadcasters. That might not be high-profile, but, but <laughs> the coaches and the managers, you go through there, it's, it's amazing to think of a one team, you know, you had all the, the hockey smarts, right? Mm -hmm. Quenville and Tippett and Francis and all, Deneen, all these guys, Sean right? Burke is in there. Right, you got all, all these players. So they were a special group and probably just underrated by most of the National Hockey League and most of the fans. But certainly in the Hartford area, they did, they did not uh, underrate those players or their personalities. They were in love with those guys and that's what hurt the most. And that was the passion that still exists today. Did you have a favorite whaler of all time? Or you just you loved all the guys coming through? Well, remember when I was a fan, because when I started working in 84, I stopped being a fan, right? Yes, you have to. <laughs> okay, so I'm a fan from 69 to 83. And I wasn't a fan of the WHA, because the WHA cut into the American Hockey League, mm -hmm. took a lot of the players, almost put that league out of business. American Hockey League shrunk down to six teams in 1976. And Eddie Shore's son-in-law, Jack Butterfield, um, did a masterful job just propping the league back up so they would stay in business. 
So we were against them during the WHA days. But when they were Whalers, you know, probably Kevin and Ronnie are probably at the, they were everybody's favorite players, but I was a huge Bruin fan. I'm not kidding anybody. Yeah. So through those years, once Bobby Orr and that group left, then it was Raymond Bork and all that. Now, you moved to Carolina. You sure head down there. Yeah. How was that transition for you? Well, it was a culture shock at first. <laughs> uh, the biggest thing and the most frustrating thing, Chris, was the fact that you go from being in a hockey-savvy market or area of the country to a place where a lot of people were asking you, what are you doing here? It hurt. I mean, it wasn't... And you weren't even in Raleigh those first two years. No, and that was, logistically, that was difficult to commute back and forth to Greensboro, which is 90 miles outside Raleigh for every home game. So we had road games all the time, and uh, you took your, your lumps from the media that would take pot shots at the organization. You had the Hartford people that were jaded and scorned. You had the Canadian media who said Raleigh doesn't deserve to have hockey. We were part of that because the building was empty all the time, so we earned our stripes that way too until we finally got rolling and educated the area to what this is all about. And, it was difficult because there was a really good. Ho there were a lot of really good hockey people there trying to make it work. You had the minor leagues through there. You had the Ice Caps. Uh, yeah, you had the Charlotte Checkers for all right. those years. And so there was there was there was some awareness of the game, but uh, moving there. To, if you look at Raleigh and the Triangle today, as it was in 1997, it's like two totally different, different places. Way. Yeah. Have you enjoyed the transition down there now? Sure, because this has been the most rewarding thing that you can do. You know, it's great to call hockey games. It's great to you know, call playoff games and work at a national network and things like that. But when you can work for a team, too, and be part of a, a ground floor, uh, kind of a burgeoning of, a, of an existence and an identity and a brand and everything, then you're really making an impact. The Caniacs. Because you could just, you could be the voice, of no, no disrespect to be, uh, Joe Bowen, but you could be the voice of the Toronto Maple Leafs and just show up and call the games. And people love them, but, you know, they bring in another guy and, and it's the people love the Maple Leafs, you know. And, with us, what we do, we've actually had, a, I think, a role in helping market the team, which has been very rewarding. Now it's on. Now it's in a good situation, and I can uh, I can roll over and leave at any point. <laughs> when we get back with John, we're going to talk to him about some fun stuff in the NHL.